Hi, welcome everybody to the next product line video uh, today with a new face. So I'm Sebastian, I'm uh, here on the slides and I will do the next three videos with you. So I'm a postdoc at Ulm uh, together uh, in the Thomas's group. And yeah, I'm doing research in uh, product line testing, which is what we are talking about today. And yeah, let's have some fun. Okay, so first of all, what we are talking about today, so we're looking at product line testing, right? So you already looked at what is a product line, how can I develop one, uh, how can I analyze specific uh, properties of the product line, and today we're going to have a look at how to test um, a product line in the sense of, okay, we want to uh, see whether it's um, bug-free, uh, whether it adheres to the specifications and the requirements, and so that uh, everything behaves uh, as we intended to. So the three things we are talking about, the three parts is, first of all, what are challenges when we're talking about uh, testing a product line? And for this, we will have a short recap on what is testing in general. Uh, what do we mean when we say we want to design a test case? And um, how can we this apply to product lines then where we have lots of different variability, large configuration space, and so on. And then we want to talk about specific, um, specific techniques for applying testing. So one thing we want to talk about is combinatorial interaction testing, which is sort of a black box approach, which I will explain later on in detail, and also solution space sampling, which is more of a white box approach where you also look at the implementation artifacts of a product line. So, but let's start uh, first with a small recap about quality assurance. So the actual goal that we are trying to achieve when we are talking about um, testing. So first of all, testing is part of quality assurance. So this means we just want to avoid having bugs in our implementation, so in our product line uh, or in general in our software system. So we want wanted to have specific behavior and we don't want it to have any behavior that is um, yeah, differentiating from that. So for this, we can have different techniques. So here we um, differentiate between three um, three approaches. So the organizational one is where you have a process model that you follow when you are developing your product line. And this product, uh, this um, process model like domain scoping, which uh, you talked about in lecture eight, um, this helps you to derive a software product line or a software system that is um, bug free. So you already develop, uh, it, uh, develop it in such a way that you don't um, yeah, create bugs or something. But of course, this is sometimes not enough. You can still uh, make mistakes there. And so there are other techniques um, that you can uh, adhere to. So another one would be um, using guidelines. So this would be a more constructive approach. So you have, um, can have specific guidelines that you follow or code conventions. And um, this is something you also talked about in uh, lecture nine. And there, um, this is another uh, safety mechanism for you to avoid making bugs in the first place. So when you're developing or when the developers of a software product line implement um, their, their implementation artifacts, they don't uh, implement any bugs or any undesired behavior. But nevertheless, uh, even if you follow guidelines, have a, a good process model, you can still, of course, make mistakes. And this is where the analytical part comes in, where you look at the things you actually have developed, and then you can um, look whether there are still uh, any bugs inside. So one approach would be a static analysis that you can do. So any analysis where you look at the source code and try to reason about, okay, does this work as intended? Is it uh, adhering to the requirements and to the specifications that I had pre um, beforehand? So there, of course, uh, when you do the compilation of a specific product, you can see whether there are any compilation problems there. And of course, on top of that, you can have a static code analysis, for example, to find for example, memory leaks or anything else that um, you can reason about without actually executing the code. Because executing the code, this is then the other approach that you can take. So simply develop your program, your system, then compile it, and then run it and look whether it behaves according to uh, what you desire. And for this, we have uh, sort of two approaches. We have a black box approach, which ignores the source code. So it just treats the whole system as a black box. You put something in, you get something out, and you compare the input, um, um, the output that you expect with the actual output that the system gives you. And if this is what you expect, then it's more, it's assumed to be bug free. Uh, but if there's any, um, any discrepancy that you see there, then there's probably something inside that you want to fix. 
And of course, there's also the white box approach where you then take the actual implementation, the source code into account. And there you can um, do more to derive your actual test cases. So for instance, you can look at data dependency and control flow. And from there reason about, okay, where could be a, um, particular bugs that I uh, want to test for. So of course, uh, we want to focus on um, executing um, our product line. We want, want to look at a static analysis in this lecture. And so we uh, look at white box and black box testing. So first of all, um, we um, want to look at specific challenges that we have when we're looking for testing a product line in comparison to just testing a single system. And then we want to look at black box testing for software product line where we ignore the source code. and in the third part, we want to look at white box testing where we take the source code into account. Okay, so let's start with the first part. What are actual challenges when we uh, talk about product line testing? And for this, we do a small recap of um, testing. Uh, so what is testing in general for software system and uh, what are test case uh, designs that we can take? So software testing in general is that we want to test whether a specific system um, is yeah, it's adhering to the specifications that we put out beforehand. So we want to uh, make sure that it behaves uh, according to plan. So we differentiate between a, a certain different things here. So for one, we can do validation testing, yeah, we, where we uh, want the testing to convince us that uh, everything works um, um, as specified by the requirements. So, and you can, of course, the test can convince us as a developer and also the actual users of the system. And another thing that we could uh, look at when we don't want to um, validate the software, we can also look directly for any defects that are in there. So this is what we call defect uh, testing. So when we give it uh, the system a specific input or a sequence of inputs, then we want to see whether uh, it behaves um, like we specified and it gives us the output that we actually expect or behaves uh, as we expect. So, and then we are looking, of course, for discrepancies there. And if we find any, then apparently there's a defect in our software system. So, and then we can also differentiate between different stages, of course. So during development, we normally have something that's called uh, development testing. So where the developers of the system itself uh, run tests, so like unit tests or integration tests um, over and over again. And um, maybe you also have something like continuous integration pipeline, where then during development, looking for bugs and anything um, you are yeah, trying to fix so that uh, the system works at the end. And then when it comes to releasing the system, so making a specific uh, version, then we also have something uh, which we call release testing. So after we make the release, we have a more comprehensive uh, test suite with more complex test cases, most uh, often also a different testing team, which then uh, again tests the whole system, um, probably also complete use cases for the system, and then uh, sees whether everything uh, behaves according to plan. And on top of that, we also have user testing, which is really similar to release testing, but it's done by the actual users of the system. So this is sort of like a, a beta testing where you give the system to users, uh, say to them, okay, please try it out, see whether everything um, behaves according to plan or whether there is something that we uh, still need to fix. Yeah, for example, you can also think of uh, early access games where you do a similar principle. Yeah? You give it to the users and then you collect feedback. So. Another thing which we could uh, differentiate is uh, between manual and automated tef testing. Of course, manual testing where uh, somebody just uh, gives the system some input, then behaves or observes the system, see whether the um, output that he or her expects um, um, yeah, is the same as uh, the actual output of the system. But of course, in many um, circumstances, we can automate this process. And whenever we can do, this is really preferable to have automated testing where we have some system that runs automated tests. And of course, this way we can have lots of more test cases in the same time and in the end have a, a, a larger uh, detection potential for uh, potential failures. Okay, then. What is actually a test case? Um, so when we, uh, so now we said, okay, what we want to achieve with testing. So and now we want to do it in this uh, in a systematic way. So and for this, of course, there are different um, definitions in the literature. So we have picked here one from uh, Ludwig and Lichter, and um, they define the systematic test as uh, a test where the setup is defined. So everything is in a controlled environment, and we have chosen the inputs that we give to the system somehow systematically. 
Yeah, so um, like we are testing specifically edge cases or typical inputs of the system and not just random values. And the results of all the tests that we run are uh, well documented. So we always get a, a comprehensive list of whether a test passed, whether a test failed, and if it fails, where did it fail, and uh, what were the uh, context of the, of the test run. So, and from uh, this systematic test design, we can, of course, derive test cases. And the test case uh, is one specific um, run of the um, system or of a part of the system where we have a specific input value. Yeah, for each test case, is a specific input value and a specific um, expected output. And then we can run the system, we can give it the input value, and we can observe uh, how it behaves and also what the output is. And then we can compare the output to the expected output. And if um, this, um, this doesn't match, yeah, then we obviously have found a bug or a defect in our system. There's also something that we call an exhaustive test, where you just test all the possible input values for a function. But as you can imagine, this uh, most of the time doesn't really make sense because there are lots of input values Think of a, a function, for example, where you have a, a simple integer parameter and you have over 4 billion different inputs that you could give this function. So there, um, it doesn't really make sense to test all the input values. And this is, of course, why we want to have um, test cases that test reasonable values. Um, and so, of course, in the end, um, we want to have test cases that detect um, errors. So and this is it's a bit counterintuitive, the definition here. But um, of course, when a test case detects a, a failure, this is something positive. Yeah? So we say a test case execution is positive when it detects actually a bug. And it's also, on top of that, successful if the bug that it is detecting is uh, unknown to us. So it's something new that we didn't know about our system, so some problem in the behavior. And then we know about this uh, from the test uh, that we executed, and then we can uh, fix this bug. And so. Of course, we don't want to run uh, many, many, many test cases, but we want to be clever about this. Yeah? We want to do it systematically. And so for an ideal test case, we have some properties that um, are um, ideally um, all fulfilled. So when we look at a specific test case, we want it to be representative. Yeah. So um, think about all the uh, exhaustive tests that we could do with all the different input uh, values. We want to have a test case that um, is representative for all these different test cases that we could potentially run. So that would test all the different input values. Yeah, And uh, the test cases that we actually select in the end should somehow cover all of these large, um, um, large uh, input values. So, but at the same time, we also want the test to be uh, failure sensitive. So we want that each test case has a high probability to actually detect a failure. Yeah? So maybe that it uh, tests a lot of uh, statements in the code. Yeah? That could be something that increases the probability there. And in addition to that, we also want the test cases to be non-redundant. So ideally, every test case tests something different in the system, and not two test cases test the same function twice, um, maybe even with uh, similar input values. This is something we want to avoid. And you already see there's a, a kind of a conflict of interest there. So uh, sometimes it's good to have a test case that tests a lot of things and so has a high uh, detection uh, failure probability. And sometimes uh, it's better to have lots of small cases that are then non-redundant. So there you have to find a good balance between tests that have a high failure potential and tests that are uh, non-redundant. And you can see here, this is a bit of a conflict of interest here. Yeah. So it's always good to uh, find a good balance. So how do we actually use this all um, for software product lines now? So for software product lines, we have a, an additional thing that we have to consider. It's the variability, of course. So we need to run test cases, but also for the variability in our software. So what is one thing we could do is um, we could take a look at our product line. Yeah, here's a really small example. And we could just generate all the valid configurations for our product line. And then for each configuration, we would have a test suite with lots of different test cases. And for all the configurations, all the products we can derive from them, we run all the test cases. And in the end, we have completely tested our product line. But you see already for this uh, small product line here, we already have 26 valid configurations. And if you, of course, uh, recall the earlier lectures, uh, you know that this number increases exponentially uh, most of the time with the numbers of features. So actually, for 
larger product lines, even uh, some with only only a handful of features, this might not be feasible. Um, so in general, this is not possible to just list all the configurations and then run tests for every configuration. This just doesn't scale, right? And on top of that, of course, you have lots of redundant testing. And as we just learned, uh, we actually want to avoid this. Yeah? So when you look at the configurations here in this example, for, uh, for example, you have lots of configurations um, that share features. Yeah? And then, of course, when you have a test case that tests a specific feature, then this is repeated for every configuration that contains this feature. And so this is just redundant testing effort. And this is something we totally want to avoid because it doesn't give us new information about the system. So. Um, just as a reminder of how big a software product line can be. So here is a um, um, yeah, feature model of the Linux kernel. And you can see this is just a, just, just a snippet of the entire uh, model. Uh, it continues uh, to the left, to the right. And um, yeah, so there are so many features that we are not even able to count how many configurations we have with uh, this particular product line. And of course, if we can't count them, we also can't just list everything and run test cases for each configuration. So it's simply not possible for the Linux kernel. But also for other industrial product line where we know the number of configurations. So this is drawn here in this, um, in this diagram. Um, so you can see here, um, this is a log scale here. Um, with the number of configurations and uh, the number of features on the y and uh, the x-axis, and you can see um, this grows, of course, exponentially. Um, so the number of features that you have um, then uh, logarithmically uh, exponentially increases the number of configurations, and it's simply not feasible to test uh, 10 to the uh, 26 configurations. Yeah, so you can't. Uh, uh, just list all of them and run test cases. You wouldn't finish in, uh, yeah, in any reasonable any reasonable amount of time. So, and on top of that, um, there's um, this general um, principle that we have when we are looking at, um, yeah, this testing uh, when we execute the system. So, yeah, there is a, a famous sentence from Dijkstra um, that you can't really prove with testing the absence of any bugs. Of course, you can detect whether bugs are present if you choose the right test cases, but you never can prove that your system is completely bug-free. Yeah, because when you want to prove such a thing, you have to test every input. So, and when we can't do this for a single system, then we could also ask the question, okay, why then consider all the configurations from a um, software product line? Yeah, so that's essentially the same question. So maybe we can find a reasonable, um, reasonable subset of um, configurations that we want to test, and then only look at these and then be reasonably sure that our um, uh, software product line is bug-free or yeah, uh, at least uh, behaves according to our specifications. OK, so then what's the alternative? Of course, we cannot look at all the configurations at least as we just saw. Um, so what about just looking at one configuration? Yeah, and Maybe we even try to be a bit clever about it and um, take a configuration that uh, contains a lot of features. Yeah. So for our example here, um, we use um, this configuration here at the bottom, and it contains six features. Yeah. So um, that's the configuration with the most number of features um, uh, selected at the same time that you can get. Yeah. There's a there's another one here, uh, but these are different features. Um, but when we're selecting such a configuration, then we can be reasonably certain that um, many features already have been tested. Yeah? So this is something we could do. We could just take one representative configuration and then test just this configuration and can be reasonably sure that um, the features that are contained here don't contain any bugs, yeah? depending, of course, on our test cases that we actually run. And this is the nice advantage that this is applicable to almost any um, product line. Yeah? So if we can um, derive a configuration, we can test the configuration. Yeah, no problem. And we even have a strategy for this. Yeah? It's called the all yes config, uh, which tries to select as many features as possible. So we can, for almost any product line, uh, generate such a configuration. And then yeah, we could just test this configuration. And of course, this wouldn't entail any redundant um, effort. Yeah? at least not from the configurations. Uh, the test cases, again, is another uh, point that we have to consider then um, when we have test cases that share code, um, then of course we have some redundant test of thought, but we at least not uh, running the same test case for different configurations twice, yeah? because we're only testing one configuration here. 
But of course, uh, as you already see, um, this is not always uh, a clever idea because some features uh, don't get tested in that way. Yeah. So for example, uh, what I just showed you, the configuration that we selected don't contain the feature Linux, for example. Yeah. And so this means if we only select this configuration, then we don't test Linux at all, yeah? which would be a bad thing because if this feature uh, contains a bug, then we never have even a chance of detecting it. And Another thing that you have to keep in mind, you also don't uh, test any specific interactions between features or only the ones that are contained in the configuration that you have selected. And if you um, recall the lecture nine where you talked about uh, feature interactions, you also know that there are interactions between not only features being present at the same time, but also features uh, missing. Yeah. So here in this toaster example, right? So there is one feature missing. So the second slice of bread, and this has um, this has some um, uh, this has some uh, problems uh, when you're toasting just one slice of bread. Yeah, it gets too dark. So this is something that you also want to test. So different combinations of features, also both features chosen and uh, missing features. This is something you actually want to test um, and not just one configuration because then you are easily missing these interactions. Okay, and of course, there is a middle ground between this, yeah? So we said, okay, uh, testing all configurations doesn't scale, testing only one configuration might be not, uh, not, um, uh, yeah, uh, not enough. So there's a middle ground. We only test some products, yeah? And this is what we call sample-based test testing, uh, which is something we want to um, talk about in the next, uh, next two parts. Uh, more in detail. And so a sample just refers to a list of configurations. So it's uh, normally a really small subset of the uh, set of all configurations. And then we test just these configurations in the sample. And then we can be reasonably sure that there is no bug in our configuration. And this is a really common te uh, technique for testing product lines. So generate a sample and then only test these configurations that are in the sample. And of course, you have different options for choosing such a, a sample. So of course, you can have um, a sample that is curated by some experts. So they're just uh, selecting uh, specific configurations, maybe configurations that are uh, used in the past or that are uh, currently uh, out there in the, um, yeah, in the fields uh, being used by some users of your product line. Uh, you can also just randomly generate configurations for a sample, or you can be uh, trying to be a bit more clever and choose them somehow systematically. And this is something we also want to look at in the next parts. So what are then advantages? Of course, um, we are solving the two problems that we have seen before, right? So we have um, lower effort than testing uh, all configurations. Indeed, we have much lower effort than testing all configurations because these samples tend to be really small compared to the uh, set of all configurations. And also we have a higher chance of finding defects than just testing one configuration, yeah? especially if we are a bit clever about choosing which configurations we actually want to test. But still, there's now a new problem yeah, that remains. So how many configurations uh, do I want to have in my sample? And of course, which ones? Yeah? So depending on uh, whatever methods I am um, choosing for um, finding my sample, I have to answer these questions. So how many um, random configurations do I want to generate? Uh, which configurations um, do I want to generate systematically? Or how many should uh, an expert look out for? So these are questions that we have to answer when we uh, want to generate a sample. So yeah, here just as an illustration, so you can imagine all these uh, different um, configurations here with the Lego minifigures. And from this uh, set, we want to uh, select just a few, and then we want to have a detailed look, which means testing in this case for just these um, yeah, mini figures. Okay, so and now we are already at the end of part one. So what we talked about, of course, is um, just testing in general and how uh, test case design works. And then we try to apply this to software product lines. So we talked about testing all configurations for software product line, and then running test cases there, um, just testing one configuration. And we've seen the advantages, disadvantages of both of these methods. And in the end, um, we said, OK, maybe there's a more reasonable approach, which then is sample-based testing, where we test just a uh, few configurations. So if you want to do a bit further reading here, um, you can have uh, a look at this um, overview from 2018, uh, which gives you uh, lots of uh, different um, yeah, sampling methods out there. Um, yeah, and you can have a look at uh, this. We also uh, have a look at them in the next um, parts. But 
this of course is more comprehensible. And there's also a, a database which shows you lots of different algorithms for creating samples and also how they are evaluated uh, in terms of how effective they are, how efficient they are and so on. So, and uh, maybe as a little uh, practice, um, you can have a small recap on what are feature interactions actually. So when you're um, thinking back about um, testing just one configuration, so what are feature interactions that uh, could be missed um, when you're just um, looking at one configurations? And uh, what are also feature interactions that could be missed when you're just um, using static analysis um, for your system? So maybe uh, have a look at this and yeah, then see you next uh, in the second part. <laughs>